Hello, my name is Emma, and this is my friend Benjamin. Benjamin is another Ingvid teacher who makes a lot of different lessons on different English topics. So today is a special lesson um, where we are going to be talking about where we're from and some of the cultural differences we've noticed. Between North America and uh, the UK. Okay, so Benjamin, can you tell us where you're from? Of course, I'm from the southwest of the UK, from a county called Devon, next to Cornwall. Okay. You've you've been to the UK. You've visited London and Bath. Um, I've visited all over the UK, and while I was there, I noticed a lot of differences between our cultures. Now, Bath, as you said, was one of the words we had in the other video we've made, where we are looking at the at the differences in how. Uh, we speak. So um, in British English, especially in RP, it's often Bath. Um, but in other accents of the UK, that's something totally different. But that's something we explore in that other video. But it's great that you've been over to the UK. And I'm certainly really enjoying being in Canada. It's a fantastic place to visit. So how long have you been here for? I've been here for just under a week. Okay. And have you ever been to the United States before? I have, yes. Um, I'd love to go to New York. and I've never been there. I've been to um, Los Angeles, San Francisco, San Diego. Um, I've got a friend who um, has a horse ranch out in New Mexico, so I've spent some time out there with him. Okay. And the reason I'm asking Benjamin this is because um, we're looking at the general or what is generally similar in North America, because there are differences between Canada and the United States, but there are a lot of similarities between Canada and the United States. So I'm going to talk about um, what happens in North America in terms of culture, and we can also talk about how it's different from British culture. Of course. Okay, so let's look at some points on how um, our cultures might differ a little bit. Um, let's start with small talk. In the UK, what kinds of things do you talk about when you meet somebody for the first time? Um, well, my wife would probably tell me that I'm terrible at small talk, but uh, I'll try and answer that question. I think it depends uh, who you're with and where you're with and what stage um, in your life you're at, whether you've got children or whether you're fresh out of university, you're gonna have different interests according to that stage that you're at in your life. Um, but I think there are going to be similarities that, I mean, it's a gender stereotype that guys like talking about sport, but um, certainly quite a few do. Of course, there are um, cosmopolitan and cultured people who like talking about the arts and people who are more interested in talking about the countryside. Um, so I think it just depends on, on the person and what their interests are. Okay. From a North American perspective, um, like you're saying, it also differs. But I would say some of the major things people talk with uh, strangers or acquaintances about is work is a very common topic, the weather, sports, and I would say TV shows. We often ask people, what shows are you following? Or what movies have you seen lately? Well, we love to talk about the weather. Um, in the UK, the weather is constantly changing. And often the weather forecasts are wildly inaccurate. Um, so um, you know, and one of the things we're going to talk about here is positivity versus um, grumbling and moaning. And the weather is a constant source that, of, uh, of moaning. It's either too hot or it's too cold. It's never the right weather. Okay, so that's interesting. If you visit either North America or the UK, um, the weather is a great topic for um, talking to strangers about. It's perfect for small talk. Yeah, that and asking how to get somewhere. Um, there's a fantastic book uh, written by Bill Bryson called Notes from a Small Island in which he um, tours around the whole of the UK and he, he uh, talks about how you can spend hours talking to someone about how to get from A to B and which road and the B324 is going to be slightly slower at this time of day. And yeah, we love talking about roads. <laughs> That's so funny because I would imagine just with um, GPS or Google Maps, those conversations might be shorter now. <laughs> um, yes, but, you know, it's all British people um, can be stereotyped as liking to moan. And the slow traffic is certainly a source um, for grumbling and complaining. Okay. Um, 
So let's talk about maybe some other things we might talk about. I mentioned that North Americans often talk about work. One of the first questions we ask somebody is, what do you do? Um, you know, tell me about your job. Tell me about your work. Is this the same in the UK? Um, I think that would come across as being quite upfront. Um, I think we would want to get into that conversation more sort of gently. Yeah, of course, if you're meeting someone, that will come out. But um, it just has to be sort of approached in a kind of gentle manner, I would say. Um, certainly some of my friends prefer not to talk about work when, when they're out socialising. Um, so, no, it's not generally the first question you would ask. It would be more like, where are you from? Um, which, yeah, you know, I would say. Okay, so maybe that's one difference. We talk a lot about work in North America. Uh, actually, another question about that. Can you talk about salaries and how much money you make? Definitely you not. Make? No, absolutely not. Okay, you cannot talk about that in North America either. We never ask each other how much money do you make. That would be inappropriate. Yeah. Um... I mean, I'd say even with sort of brother-in-laws and sister-in-laws, it would be um, slightly invasive. And I would agree to that from a North American perspective. Um, okay, so we've talked a bit about small talk. Um, one other thing I wanted to ask about work is um, I've heard that people in the UK get a lot more vacation days. So in North America, the norm is two weeks of vacation. Um, some people get a little bit more, they might get three weeks, but in general, it's two or three weeks. Is this the same in the UK? Six weeks in the UK. Yeah, we love our holidays. Uh, people take time off. I mean, that, that's, that's standard, that's not for um, everyone. Some people certainly have a lot less than that. And if you're working as a uh, freelancer, then obviously the notion of holiday is doesn't really exist because you only get paid when you're working so but I would say generally speaking we have more holiday people like to have a summer holiday maybe they take their kids somewhere um, I mean there are also great holidays that can be taken in the UK um, if you want to go camping or beach holidays um, where I'm from in the southwest is uh, quite a traditional place to go on holiday and um, we've got great surfing up in the north coast of Devon, um, some lovely walking on Dartmoor, um, two national parks. It's, you know, there are, um, you can stay in the UK on holiday, but if you really want some sun, then people hop on a plane and go down into southern Europe. Okay, so maybe that might be another difference is what is common for vacations. In Canada, as well as in the United States, Camping is very popular. We often go camping, um, you know, where we set up a tent, we have like the fire going, we look at the stars. Grizzly bears. Grizzly bears are a thing for sure. Lots of wildlife. Um, but because Canada and the United States are both very large countries, it's not so common to go to like Germany or Italy or France or to other countries just because um, it's very costly. So you might get these vacations, but they're not so frequent, mm. I would say. Yeah, it's, uh, well, I was speaking to the cameraman yesterday and he was telling me about sometimes he goes off with like a friend and they sort of drag boats behind them and have their sort of food on their back. And I think there's definitely a really great exploration of the wilderness out here in Canada. And my aunt and uncle have caught a train from Toronto out to Vancouver and uh, your railway is famed as being particularly beautiful. Lots of people in the UK would like to come to Canada. It's on a lot of people's bucket list as being a great place to go. And it's the same with a lot of Canadians would like to go to Britain, I think, because it's so nice to um, see the culture, see a lot of the historical buildings. It's quite different in, in many different ways. What did you think of Bath when you went there? So I went to a small city called Bath. Bath. I, I would pronounce it as Bath. Um, I loved it. It was just so beautiful. It reminded me of a Jane Austen novel. Like I felt like I was traveling back in time 
Um, well, there is the Jane Austen Museum there, and I think she wrote uh, some of her novels in Bath. Yeah, I actually visited that museum, and yeah. I'm a, a big Jane Austen fan, so, um, you know, it, it was amazing. Um, yeah, th there are some lovely places to visit in the UK. I think being a bit biased and from the southwest, you've got Bath, Bristol, Exeter, uh, really attractive towns. Um, a lot of people make the mistake of just going to London. Um, and London's much more expensive than the rest of the, city, the rest of the country. And yes, there are some fantastic things to do in London. We've got amazing world-class museums that are mainly free to get into. It's very, it's reasonably easy to get around the city. Um, excellent transport network, um, the West End. But there's more outside of the city. Um, so if you're going to the UK, hop on a train and go to places like York or um, I don't know, if you want to see the alternative scene, go down to Brighton. Um, there's lots to see. Wow. Um, so we've talked about vacations now and it sounds like there's a lot to do in, in England. There's a lot to do in Canada and the, and the United States. Um, one of the other differences I would say between North American culture and British culture is the sports people watch and follow. Would you say that's correct? Yes. Um, ice hockey hasn't really caught on uh, back home. Um, I love cricket. Not everyone loves cricket back home. Um, football is the main sport. Um, and I've actually made a video on football culture on, on my Ingvid channel. And before you go any farther, I should also mention that what Benjamin means by football is different from my understanding of football. When we're talking about Benjamin's um, idea of You football, understand it as soccer. We, we talk about it as soccer. And we have American football, which is... You throw the ball yes. and have helmets and things. So you're saying that soccer football is... Um, yeah, it's number one. Yeah. Um, from sort of middle of August through to May, then it's a huge long season. But yeah, football is very popular. Whereas basketball, baseball, hockey, um, and American football, I would say, are more popular in North America. Um, I don't really know anyone who follows cricket or rugby, um, so yeah. I think those sports are less common here. Hopefully England are about to win the World Cup final um, in rugby. I might be eating my words in a few <laughs> days' time, but uh, we'll see. Okay, so what about, um, this is another difference I've heard about, and I, I noticed when I went and visited the UK, is there seems to be a difference between pub culture and coffee culture. And what I mean by that is in Canada and the United States, we often go for coffee. Coffee or, you know, coffee shops, cafes, they're very popular. And a lot of our socializing is spent in coffee shops. What about in the UK? I think it varies depending on where you are. Uh, certainly you can find cafes, like a traditional, quite um, no-nonsense, no-frills cafe where you can go in and get a great breakfast and a good old cup of tea. Um, of course, we have the chains of coffee shops um, that are pretty much all over the world. Um, they are there. There are also independent coffee shops where you can get excellent cakes and um, different hot drinks. Um, but are they seen as a place where uh, people go and sit in front of a laptop, perhaps? Um, if you did, th that's not so accepted in, in pubs, which are seen as being a social place, uh, particularly in the evenings or uh, during the weekends. And it's a place where you can go and watch sports if it's a sports pub and there's a big screen um, and there's music in pubs and pub quizzes so uh, I think pubs have been an important part of different communities across the UK particularly in rural ones where there aren't that many different places you can go to perhaps and there'll be uh, I remember when I was working in a in a pub when I was 18 years old um, really deep into the um, Devon countryside and there was an auction of um, homegrown vegetables to celebrate Harvest Festival 
and then um, the local vicar came in and we all sang, um, uh, what was it? We plough the fields and scatter. Um, so it was really, it was just very sort of just a, a good atmosphere, good local atmosphere. Um, not all pubs are like that. Some are not so nice to go to, but you've got to pick the right one. And so like in North America, usually when we're talking about pubs, we use the word bar. There's a bit of a difference, but in general, people here at night, they might go to bars to drink and to hang out with their friends, but it's more of a party scene or maybe to watch sports. Whereas a pub sounds like it's actually more for the community or for families or... Um, yeah, it just depends. And certainly there'll be nights in the year where it's geared up for celebration, like New Year's Eve. Um, w one of the trends that we've been having in the pubs back in the UK is that they're um, going much more into the gastronomic side of things, providing um, quite high level food service that traditionally is just a place where you went to go and have a pint. But now it's a place where you go and have a, a two course meal and um, maybe more inclusive of families. Okay. And in terms of, um, in North America, sometimes people go for drinks after work, but it's not like, you know, so common. Mm -hmm. It depends on the, the job you're doing. It depends on the industry. Some people might go, but a lot of people after work are tired and they won't go to a bar. In the UK, do most people go to the pub after work? No, I wouldn't say so. Um, I'd say that it's pretty similar um, and it also depends on the life that you're living. You know, if you've got a dog back home that you need to go and walk, then you don't go to the pub, you go and walk the dog. If you've got a young family to look after, then it would be very selfish to sort of go off to the pub for the whole evening. So it depends on your individual responsibilities. Um, for a lot of people, going to the pub is kind of a special event. Um, like. You know, it's nice to go and meet people. Obviously, some people go more habitually, but it's not the norm. Okay. Okay. So that's interesting. So maybe that was a bit of a stereotype I might have had about um, British pub culture. We don't live there. Because <laughs> that's the stereotype I had. <laughs> Although sometimes they are very cozy places. If they've got like a nice open fire, um, they can be a lovely place to go in the winter or... Um, certainly some of the country pubs I've been to, like if I'm playing a game of cricket and then you have a lunch in the pub before you go and play cricket, you know, it's just part of, um, part of life. Okay. Um, so one thing I really noticed about British culture is it seems more acceptable to, I think, could you use the word whinging? Is that to moan, grumble. Moan, grumble. Um, whereas here it sounds like, or in North America, we tend to have to show a very optimistic, positive approach to things. Um, so like if somebody asks you how you're doing, you'll usually say, oh, you know, everything's wonderful. Or you, you try to look at the bright side. There's a pressure to always seem positive on things. Do you find that's the same in, in the UK? I think certainly in a work context, you have to be reasonably upbeat like no one wants to work with someone who is totally miserable the whole time because they sort of pull the energy down but I don't think we have quite the same culture of perhaps self-help that is prevalent in North America um, maybe it's something to do with the weather that uh, we're maybe slightly more naturally pessimistic um, I don't know um, and I find that actually quite refreshing. That's one of the reasons why I love meeting people from England. Um, I like that culture where you can, you know, jokingly moan and groan about the weather or work. Or and I think it depends on different where you are in the UK. Um, the county of Yorkshire up in the northeast is they have a particular reputation for calling a spade a spade um, of saying things how they are. Um, and I actually studied up there and um, I found the people, I just enjoyed their honesty. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So the next point is a very big point, I would say, between our cultures. And that is the culture of tipping. 
So when you go to a restaurant in England, do you leave a tip? Yeah, you're, yeah, you're meant to. Yes, um, makes it sound like I don't. Um, I don't go to restaurants that often, to be honest. Um, but I think the standard rule is ten to fifteen percent. Um, but it, it's not sort of hugely in people's awareness. Like, yeah, you're meant to give something to the people who work in restaurants. Um, but I don't think it's as big uh, a percentage as it is here. Here um, in North America, it's between 15% and 25%. Um, in Canada, usually people tip about 15%. But in the United States, it can be higher, like 20 or 25%. Um, but it is a big part of the meal. You often have people pull out their calculators and try to figure out exactly the 15% or just you know do the math to make sure that they're leaving an appropriate tip. Do you think it makes the service better? No. Yeah, even if the service is terrible, people still probably will tip. Right. Um, so I think that is a big difference. And I think we also tip more workers. We don't just tip in restaurants. We tip hairdressers, taxi cab drivers, um, you know, uh, bartenders. So there's a lot of different people we, we tip here. With taxis, I mean, a lot of it is done on Uber these days, and they can ask you afterwards um, on that app if you want to to tip. Um, if you get a black cab in London, I think it's quite standard to leave a small tip, but it's not kind of a set in stone how much you're meant to be giving. Um, yeah, if you go to a hairdresser, then again, it's polite to give uh, some sort of tip, but you're not going to have a percentage in your head, I must give this. Okay, so that, I guess, is one of the, the differences, whether or not, you know, we almost have an agreed upon percentage. An unwritten rule. An unwritten rule. That's a good way to describe it. Um, we talked a little bit earlier, Benjamin and I, about education, and we found that the education systems of our countries are quite different. Um, specifically, we were talking about high school. I often hear British people talk about A-levels, mm -hmm. and that has always been very confusing for me because we don't have a levels in north america what do you call the sort of 17 18 uh, the examination at that point so in north america we in high school there tends to be four years the first year is called the freshman year second year is sophomore then there is junior and then senior in the united states at the during the senior year students will write a test called the SATs. In Canada, we do not have this test, um, but the results of that test in the United States decides where you might be accepted for university. In Canada, it's all based on your, your grades. Sure. Um, what about in, in the UK? Yeah, I mean, the grades are absolutely essential to getting into the university of your choice if you're deciding to do that. Some people do choose to leave education at the age of 16 to go and do vocational training, i.e. apprenticeships. Uh, but the main public exams are uh, GCSE, where you typically study around nine subjects. Um, the core ones of English, maths, sciences. Um, some people do individual sciences, some do them kind of lumped together. Most people do a modern language, a modern language. Uh, it's typical to have to choose between geography and history and then do um, a humanities subject or an art subject. Um, and then after you finish GCSE, which is age roughly about 15, um, you then sort of narrow it down to about three subjects. And depending on how the school's sort of timetabling is worked out, you can basically choose whatever you're most interested in. Um, as I say, about three subjects that you will study for two years. Okay, so that is very different. And so based on this test, does that decide what you can do for your A-levels? Um, so, yeah, you, I mean, the GCSE results come out um, in August and you're going to be starting the A-level course in September. So um, it does... Your GCSE results could impact on whether you get to continue at a certain school or not, but you will have already decided what course you're looking to do at A-level before you get the results. Gotcha. Um, 
One other question I had about education was I sometimes hear about grammar schools. Yeah. What are those? So a grammar school is a selective entry school. So the school can choose um, which students um, study there, but they are part of the um, uh, government education. So they are funded by the government, maintained by the government. Um, some people think we should have more grammar schools. Some people think we should have less. But um, yeah, they are kind of top government maintained schools. Okay, so this is a dumb question, but why the name grammar schools? Like, is grammar a huge topic at them? <laughs> to be perfectly honest, I don't know the answer to that question, Emma. Um, what I would say, though, is um, that th there's lots of league tables in the UK. So based on sort of exam results and looking at how much progress students make, um, and we have um, a government approved in inspection body called Ofsted that um, gives gradings um, all the way from sort of nurseries up to um, secondary school level. So it's quite easy to read um, the inspection reports on schools to see how good they are. And there's, um, they're easily, either classified as like totally inadequate, requires improvement, good or outstanding. And the outstanding schools will advertise that on their websites. Um, and some of those top schools can be quite difficult to get into. And uh, parents make agonizing decisions on where to live, often based on the schools um, and what's called the catchment area, which basically means where you have to live to go to those schools. OK. OK, interesting. So, yeah, so there are quite a few differences between the educational systems. And thank you for answering that question because I've been wondering about these grammar schools for quite a while now. I'll have to look that up for you. <laughs> okay, so we've covered education. Holidays and weekends. What do people in the UK usually do for holidays and on the weekend? Well, um, to, let's talk about um, holidays first. Um, I think it depends on the family and um, you know, financially what they're able to do um, and whether they prefer taking a holiday in the summer or at Easter because school holidays, there's at least two weeks in the Easter holiday, at least um, two weeks at Christmas where some people go away then, but there's the longer holiday in the summer, the school holiday is six weeks long. Um, I mean, it just depends. Like people, a lot of people go to France. Um, there's gorgeous places in Brittany and um my some of my family go to france every year and really take pride in uh practicing their french and speaking to the local people but you know it just depends there are there are holidays you can have in the uk um you can fly to anywhere in europe within uh two to three hours maximum so you know barcelona where i lived for a while is easily accessible You've got the Greek islands, which are a fantastic place to go on a summer holiday. It just depends on what's affordable and the preference of that family. Okay, so I guess it's similar. We have a lot of people who go to the Caribbean for holidays or to Mexico. Uh, those are very common destinations for North Americans because I guess they're closer and the airfare is usually cheaper. Um but what about on the weekends? What do people in the UK tend to do on the weekends? And I know this is a big question, but maybe some of the common activities? I mean, I can only sort of answer for um, our family. Like I've got little nephews and nieces and they're sort of doing sports clubs, um, learning tennis, going swimming, uh, playing in the local teams. Um, and then... Um, they also do music, so sometimes they'll go off on like a sort of music camp and uh, play in some sort of concert at the end of that. Uh, we've got a dog, so we end up doing quite a lot of walks um, in the countryside, uh, meeting up with, um, you know, I've got a young family, so going to children's birthday parties and that kind of thing. Um, it depends on people's interests, if they're into the, uh, the great outdoors, whether they go canoeing, um, trekking up Mount Snowdon, um, or whether they prefer being at home and doing some gardening or 
whether they're young and students, they like going out and there's a lot of variety. Um, one of the things that's very common in North America is brunch. A lot of people do Sunday brunch on the weekend where you meet up with your friends and you have, it's not quite breakfast, it's not quite lunch, it's the meal in between. So it usually happens around 11 a.m. and it's called brunch. So a lot of people will find different brunch uh, venues and they will eat together and just talk about their life. But that's going out to like a cafe rather than having it in a person's home. Yes, so usually it happens at a restaurant. Um, and so many restaurants here will advertise their brunch specials, which um, usually the food is different than other meals. Okay. Um, in the UK, the traditional Sunday meal is the Sunday roast, uh, which is typically if you eat meat, um, you know, you could have roast chicken, roast beef, roast lamb, um, served with potatoes, carrots, um, some people don't like Brussels sprouts, parsnips, you know, all the kind of root vegetables with gravy. Um, and then a pudding like um, apple crumble was a very sort of British um, dish. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a slightly later meal. Um, but what I do like about, um, you know, uh, Sundays in, in Europe is the kind of, some of the shops have like reduced opening times and it does feel like a quieter day. Whereas here, actually, most stores are open on Sundays, okay. maybe 5 p.m., 6 p.m. Yeah, so. in the UK, it's to about 4 p.m., the supermarkets. Okay. And, oh, sorry, I just realized what I meant by holidays here. I didn't actually mean travel holidays. I actually meant holidays we celebrate, like Halloween. Well, Halloween's big here, isn't it? I mean, I caught the bus here this evening, and I must have seen, like, the billion pumpkins and some of them are absolutely huge and the way that you guys have decorated some of your porches um, is really creative you showed me a picture the other day of um, somewhere in your neighborhood what was it that you'd seen um, so there was a house that was decorated with um, like a, a medical scene of a surgery happening that had gone wrong so you had a doctor with um, you know a bunch of blood on on him and just it was a really ghastly scene of what could go wrong in a hospital but it was like somebody's halloween decorations like outside their house um yeah it was cool um so halloween is huge here um what are the other big festivals i would say christmas is huge new year's we also have canadian thanksgiving in canada in the united states there's american thanksgiving in the US, American Thanksgiving is a huge holiday, um, whereas in Canada, it's, a, it's a, a smaller scale holiday, but Thanksgiving is a popular holiday in both countries. Um, and otherwise, I guess Easter is popular. Um, you know, the 4th of July is popular in the United States. In Canada, we have Canada Day, which is July 1st. So they're around the same time. Okay. What about in the UK? Christmas, everyone loves Christmas, particularly if it snows. If it snows at Christmas, then everyone's very happy. Well, most people are. Um, what do we have? Well, the Irish like celebrating St. Patrick's Day. Um, a lot of Guinness is consumed then. Um, but we don't really celebrate the saints like they do in, in Spain, for example. Um, New Year, people enjoy. They call it Hogmanay up in Scotland. Um, Easter is, is not a huge, uh, hugely celebrated, um, but people will typically, you know, you'll get a few days off and people will go to family and have lunch then. Um, we don't have the sort of um, independence thing at the beginning of um, July. Um, so I think maybe it's, a lot of it is orientated about the, around the sporting calendar. For example, we've got Wimbledon fortnight, um, that June um, and you know the different kind of sporting events sometimes give a bit of a shape to the year okay okay so again different countries different holidays it looks like so we've covered a lot of well some similarities but many differences between our cultures today um, so I just wanted to thank Benjamin for joining me today it's been a pleasure having you and I wanted to invite you to um, take a quiz based on what you heard in this video. Um, just, we're going to cover some of the major differences between 
British culture, and North American culture. So you can take this quiz at www.ingvid.com. I also would like to invite you to subscribe to our channels. I've checked out Benjamin's channel and it is amazing. There are a lot of great resources there on English language learning, on the voice and many other topics. So when you check out our channels, don't forget to ring the bell to subscribe. That way you can find out what new notifications or you will get new notifications for any videos that we've done. Um, did I leave anything out, Benjamin? I think you covered everything very well, Emma. All right. Well, thank you again for coming and visiting. And until next time, take care.